dear friends good evening once again welcome to you all to this class i appreciate each one of you for taking time to attend this course more than 3 decades ago a kind of awareness has been rampant among the uh, churches faith communities across the globe understanding what is happening uh, with our environment what is happening with our ecological system however now the church and theological institutions they have come forward to enlighten the faith community by offering a course particularly on ecological issue this eco justice course is very much uh, uh, required and it is very pertinent in the present context as the faith community needs to be aware of uh, the issue of issues around environment or ecological concerns thereby we can uh, encourage one another to be sensitive towards the ecological issues as well as consider ecological issue is also an issue of a spirituality friends uh, today evening we have a topic from the book of psalms let me share with you um, some slides that i have prepared wait a minute Yes. reading the book of psalms from the perspective of earth we have four topics i mean four sub themes to understand the topic uh, reading the book of psalms from the perspective of earth the first one is psalm 8 an apology for domination second one a uh, rescuing earth from a storm god psalm 29 and 96 to 97 and third one god and earth in psalm 65 the last one is earth song in psalms 90 to 92 friends i invite uh, all of you to join me and carefully listen to me as well as you know look at the screen a slide and take notes hope that uh you have had your dinner and you have a re- relaxing time you are not rushing see after the class i don't think that we have another job except joining a family prayer and then sleep so uh be uh concentrate you and follow the class take notes and also keep your bible aside whatever the psalms we are dealing with this evening you can also take a look at the psalm bible and you know read along with reading the bible from the perspective of earth let me give you a short a, a, a very short introduction about the reading the bible from the perspective of earth this was the concern that kindled the thoughts and minds of the theologians in the beginning of 21st century at the end of 20th century the ecological concern cannot be merely a theological reflection but it should be a, an action oriented theological discourse and that should be taken to the church i mean that should be available to the faith community with that concern across the globe from different uh, streams of life like theology science uh, of different different streams many people got together and they you know shared their concerns and among them the theologians you know, they started working on certain principles 
eco justice principles that will help the faith community to shape and reshape their ideas and also their understanding of ecology particularly understanding the earth understanding the creation understanding god understanding human beings understanding the living beings the species around so to understand uh, the scripture particularly the bible from an ecological point of view these six principles have been framed in order to help the faith community to read the bible from the perspective of earth the principle of intrinsic worth the principle of interconnectedness the principle of voice the principle of purpose the principle of mutual custodianship and the principle of resistance when we apply these principles in our reading in our reading of the scriptures we will certainly be enlightened to understand uh, the worth of the creation the significance of earth in our day to day life and also the way we are interconnected with one another and the voice which is silent voice which is hidden a voice unheard so far will be heard and our purpose of living on this earth and what are our roles to play and how can we you know cope up with the uh, changing scenario of environment over the years so i mean these are the basic eco justice principles framed by uh, the theologians particularly and helping the faith community to understand the need of reading the scriptures from the perspective of earth then coming to the topic our topic as i said reading the book of psalms from the perspective of earth what is the significance of book of psalms and its contribution to the eco justice theme the book of psalms explores vividly the ecological concerns and the concerns are abundant in the book the book of psalms affirms that god is the creator and many uh, themes about the creation are adequately presented in the book the philosophy of spirituality through the presentation of creation themes is fabulous excellent in the book of psalms you know god is the creator and all the creatures and all the inanimate animate and inanimate beings are wonderfully connected with god you know the 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 interrelationship between god and the people between god and the entire creation you know there emerges a kind of spirituality the philosophy of spirituality that can knit us together to live or to have a close relationship with god and the uh, hymns in the book of psalms inform the profound relationship between divine creation uh the relationship between divine and creation that's why the book of psalms is a uh, very significant when we understand and read it from the perspective of the ecology particularly for today's topic from the perspective of the earth <clears throat> the book of psalms in the life of ancient israel we need to have a little bit introduction about the book of psalms and its uh, cultural uh, context in the life of ancient israel the book of psalms is known as a song book during the second temple period and it is a collection of songs from different historical periods and it is the combination of songs of praises songs of lamentation songs of enthronement and also historical psalms one can add that the when psalms of ascent psalms of thanksgiving historical psalms wisdom psalms so and so individual and community expression of faith and fidelity on the god of israel 
is the main theme that one can understand in the book of Psalms. The book of Psalms also informs the history, faith, and community life of people of Israel over the centuries of their history. The first topic, uh, uh, sub theme, Psalm 8 an apology for domination. Psalm 8, as we read, we find it more privileged that we are just lesser than God and we are after God. You know, God is first, then uh, human beings follow. Psalm 8 affirms God-like qualities of human beings irrespective of gender and culture. It also portrays earth as an inanimate stage for the display of divine and human power rather than the vital source of life we know now, we now know it to be. Earth is portrayed in the psalm as an inanimate stage for the display of divine and human power. We need to actually understand the role, the place of earth in the book of Psalm, in the book of uh, particularly in the Psalm 8. There are two words, you know, in Psalm uh, 8 that explain or that exhibit the status of human beings. The two words, human beings, Enosh and mortals, Ben Adam in Hebrew, render Hebrew expressions with the similar meanings. Though the terms are masculine in Hebrew, like Ben Elin, the sons of God, they are both sometimes used in a generic sense, inclusive of both male and female human beings. Noticing such terms, Kathleen A. Farmer, a, a feminist theologian, encourages women to enjoy the favored position they occupy in God's created order, according to Psalm 8. Uh, just showing uh, the peak of uh, earth. However, it can be seen as an apology for the theme of domination expressed in many parts of the Bible, raising sharp issues at variance with eco justice principles. Therefore, we do need to read the psalm in the light of eco justice principles. Scholars respond to the psalm when they read or interpret it from eco justice perspective. Some subscribe to the idea of hierarchical system embedded within the cosmos where God is king, humans as the Lord's regents, earth is under the control of humans and also is considered as place of the Lord's resting feet. Thereby, earth is silent or being silenced at the power of human description of the universe. Friends, Psalm 8 actually does not give any space for earth to voice. So scholars, uh, uh, many scholars maintain that it is a psalm uh, that was being sung by uh, a group of faith community who are very much interested you know, in understanding God as a creator and also elevating human beings as the uh, lesser uh, or less divine in their nature. As human beings, they are very uh, less in the sight of God, but God elevated them as uh, next to a divine power. However, the inclusive... <laughs> The inclusive reading and interpretation considers that the earth manifests the presence of God, as we see in Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 5, and 1 Kings 8, 16. Some finds the theme of the psalm is the divine immanence. Now, the entire theme of the Psalm 8 is about divine immanence. 
whether Psalm 8 projects that earth is voiceless. Can we say that there is no engagement with the echo justice principle of voice? Since there is no mentioning of uh, the uh, space for earth to voice, can we say that there is no engagement with the echo justice principle of voice? It is understood that the Lord is addressed as sovereign and it presents the intention of psalmist in portraying the Lord as a royal figure. The word that is used for God in this psalm is Yahweh, which means the Lord. So the presentation of God as a Lord in this psalm is a royal figure. It also presents the power rather than the imminence of Yahweh as it is mighty in heaven. So it's not merely the power of Yahweh, the power of the Lord, but it is the imminence of Yahweh, a, a, a mighty imminence of Yahweh in heaven. So the question before us is, what does this psalm mean and whose interests does this psalm serve? In the traditional interpretation, one can easily identify that the Psalm 8 presents the mightiness of the Lord in heaven and allowed humans to exercise their power over the earth. Above the sky, what does it mean? Above the sky. When heaven is considered as God's abode, earth is devalued. Such an opinion certainly undermines the eco-justice principles of the intrinsic worth. By saying this, the principle, the eco-justice principle that we uh, uh, were told in the beginning actually was undermined and the principle of the intrinsic worth is absent or it can't be found in, in the Psalm 8. And also two words, dominion and under the feet. Psalm is in uh, verse 6, 5 and 6, particularly verse 6. You have given them dominion over the works of your hand. You have put all things under their feet. Dominion under the feet. Human beings are given the authority over earth and all in it so that they can be royal figures carrying the divine status. Thus, earth is in the clutches of human's power and authority. The earth's interests are certainly not central in Psalm 8, and it is candid that the worshippers self-boasting of themselves rather than glorifying God. See, when we read uh, very critically Psalm 8, we can say that it is very candid that the worshippers self-boasting of themselves rather than glorifying God. If this is the case, if uh, th this is the outcome of our critical uh, reading of Psalm 8, can we reread the Psalm 8 from the perspective of the voice of earth? One needs to understand the, dominate, the dominating human projection in this Psalm that undermines the intrinsic worth of the earth in our times. The dominating human projection. You know, uh, you have uh, uh, you have made us less, a very less to divine. What are human beings that you are mindful of them, mortals that you care for them? You have made them a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor. One needs to understand the dominating human projection in this psalm certainly undermines 
the intrinsic worth of the earth in our times. We also need to learn that earth as the victim of this domination, which we need to negate if we consider the principles of intrinsic worth and the principle of voice. The faith community hereby challenged to listen to the silent voice of earth that is groaning for the redemption of God's children. Friends, the first sub-theme actually challenges us whether we can really understand and give value to earth as it, it, it plays a pivotal role in our day-to-day -day life. Earth is the key for life. Life belongs to God and life comes from God. And earth is the given space to continue to uh, uh, enjoy the life given by God. The second topic, rescuing earth from a storm god. These two uh, psalms, particularly Psalm 29 and Psalms 96 to 97. These two psalms, I mean two uh, sets of psalms, have been read against one another in order to understand uh, the, the profound view about God and God's relation to earth. Moreover, earth, how earth does praise to the Lord, or earth silent praises to the Lord. We need to actually understand how these Psalms, Psalm 29 and Psalm 96 to 97, they talk about God and uh, God's relationship with the earth or earth association with God. Biblical theophanies present various bold representations of God's revelation through creation of the force of nature. Theophany is, you know, something like, you know, the face of God. Theos means uh, God, phenai means face. So theophany means the face of God. In other words, the presence of God, the revelation of God. Thunderstorm, wind, thunder, and lightning are few modes of divine self-expression in some of the archaic texts in ancient West Asia. Does the manifestation of Ahweh in the storm form or negate earth in this storm? Does the earth suffer at the expense of Ahweh's glorious self-revelation as the voice of Yahweh? I mean, these are two important questions before us to understand uh, through this uh, sub-theme. Does the manifestation of Yahweh, the Lord, in the storm form or negate earth in this storm? Does earth suffer at the expense of Yahweh's glorious self-revelation as the voice of Yahweh? So, voice of Yahweh, Kol Yahweh, is the uh, theophany in these psalms. In the ancient West Asian context, some songs reflect and echo canonite hymn to the storm god Baal Hadad, who stands as a victorious over his enemies. Similarly, Psalm 29 is an expression of Yahweh's manifestation in a storm theophany. Some say it is a psalm of victory. Others uh, maintain an opinion that it is a demonstration of Yahweh's advent as a Lord over creation. I mean, uh, there are a wonderful uh, opinions maintained by the scholars. The pivotal points are as follows, as we see in Psalm 29. Call to praise Yahweh as a storm god. 
the action of storm uh, storm god acclamation of storm uh, of yahweh's kingship and a plea for the people i mean these are the main content in the uh, psalm 29 to to help us understand uh, the uh, revelation of the lord yahweh as a storm god so the psalm commences a call to praise the lord praise god as a creator and he is a storm god storm here as a medium of god to reveal god self you know that is called a theophany the voice of god call yahweh and storm theophany you know the psalm actually talks about uh, how the voice of god and the presence of god they 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 go together in revealing god's presence uh, on the earth so the voice call is god's uh, god the way of communication to the earth and storm is god's self manifestation yahweh i mean the lord the lord's self manifestation the expression call yahweh the voice of the lord is usually rendered the voice of the lord and associated with the thunder as a dominant dimension of the storm in this psalm however the expression call yahweh does not refer to a loud noise but to the storm itself the call yahweh breaks and shatters twists and batters the call yahweh is the storm in action nowhere does the parallelism of the poem point to the call as thunder or a comparable component of the storm cloud noise the call yahweh is parallel with yahweh or with the god of glory the visible manifestation of the deity the call yahweh is a poetic designation of the storm theophany not the thunder as but one component of the storm here what we need to actually understand the presence of god the the the, the revelation of god is very much present in and through storm the glory of the lord revealed as a visible in the storm of psalm 29 is beheld by all people as theophany that reveals yahweh's advent in righteousness and justice as we see in psalm 97 to to 6 a violent thunderstorm becomes a manifestation of righteousness a life restoring presence how can we understand uh, the, this storm you know we can't actually during the rainy season we are uh, we have a, a rainy season now there would be you know lot of noise kind of uh, thunders we feel that something is happening a very terrific then we say oh lord save us or then we say oh jesus what does it mean whenever we experience the extraordinary presence or sounds that we hear around we feel that god is our savior the psalm 29 actually says that that storm or the thunder reveal the presence of god this as a theophany reveals the lord's advent in righteousness and justice a violent thunderstorm becomes a manifestation of righteousness a life restoring presence 
it actually not to terrify or create a chaos to the life but it is to restore the life and to give the life in its abundance the kol ahwe is parallel with the god of glory the visible manifestation of the deity so the kol ahwe or the voice of the lord is a poetic designation of the storm theophany not the thunder as but one component of the storm psalm 29 also gives a plea for justice both voice of celestial choir and the voice of yahweh silence the voice of earth and the earth community are effectively uh, silenced earth and the earth community are totally silenced in psalm 29 while in psalms 96 97 earth is summoned to sing to sing to the lord 96 1 worship the lord 96 9 rejoice in the lord 96 11 97 1 before the thundering storm the the voice of earth is suppressed before the king of righteousness the voice of earth is liberated it is precisely the use of the term for strength oars by the celestial chorus in the opening verse that the psalmist reinterprets in the closing verse the psalmist pleads for a show of strength that results in blessing but blessed of peace on earth not parading of power this pleading is tant amount to a call for akwe to surrender the role of storm god and become a god of peace for the people the psalmist does not plead directly for earth but in pleading for blessing and peace implies an interconnected world in which god creation and humanity work in harmony this is actually a very uh, a, a significant expression of god through storm not to terrify the life but to protect and restore the life there is a prayer of psalmist and when we see you know when we compare psalm 29 and uh, psalms 96 to 97 if the closing voice in psalm 29 is that of a single psalmist pleading for the people in the face of a storm god and the rampage the voices in psalms 96 to 97 are those of the entire earth community responding in praise to the manifestation of yahweh's presence these psalms we can argue rescue earth from the overpowering storm god of the earlier psalm friends as i said in the beginning in the ancient western context certain stories in the canonite uh, mythology storm represents the power of god that is to take control over the enemies but in psalm 29 and 96 to 97 particularly it is not to take control of uh, the enemy or control of something but to protect and control their chaotic disorder in the creation earth and earth community are totally silenced in psalm 29 which in psalms 96 to 97 you know as we saw it is to praise god sing to the lord worship the lord rejoice in the lord so before the thundering storm king the voice of earth is suppressed before the king of righteousness the voice of earth is liberated the restoration of earth's voice in psalm 97 is especially powerful you know the skies the land and the seas all exult in celebration that's what we see in psalm 97 11 all life 
in the seas responds with a rapturous roar 97 11 so actually psalm 96 97 help us to realize the response of earth community to the storm god in terms of the eco justice principles reflected in our approach Psalm 29 devalues earth by treating it as a domain for divine power plays. While Psalms 96 to 97 acclaim the participation of and consequent valuing of the entire earth community in a rich response to Yahweh's advent. It is especially obvious that the first Psalm negates and silences the voice of earth, while the second part of Psalms 96 to 97 makes the voices of earth and the wider earth community central to the focus of its call to celebrate. Here we see the principle of interconnectedness. It may not be articulated in terms of contemporary ecology, yet it is clear that the worshipping parties in Psalms 96 to 97 form a community united in celebration, a community that includes everything from the fish of the sea and the trees of the forest to the skies above and all peoples below. These two Psalms actually, Psalm 29, and Psalms 96-97. These two uh, set of Psalms project uh, and exhibit an understanding of God in and through storm. In the first Psalm, Psalm 29, earth is given no privilege and it doesn't have any voice to express because the psalmist confined to talk about God's theophany, the theophany, the revelation of God. Psalm 96 to 97 welcomes a faith community to celebrate the presence of God, the theophany as a restoring agency of the Lord, a life restoring presence of God to the entire earth community. So uh, the, uh, these two psalms, these two sets of the psalms help us to understand uh, the ancient faith community and their understanding of giving value and devalue uh, the earth. And third uh, sub-theme is God and earth in Psalm 65. God and earth in Psalm 65. The psalm begins with an idea that silence, praise of earth is audible. Even in the silence, there is praise of earth. Now, when, when we can we can say that earth is being silenced, even in the silence there is the sound of praise. How can silence, praise be understood? God and earth in Psalm 65, we see how, you know, how earth sings praises to the Lord. In the introduction, the word dumiya, the Hebrew term dumiya, can imply quite expectation. Psalms 39 to 62.1. And the idea of silent waiting connected with the salvation. Lamentation uh, 3.26 and 3.49. Biblical interpreters have also actually, you know, they found some accounts of the joyous song of earth. They have often placed stress on history as the sphere of God's revelation and activity. In the Psalm 65, the, the, the beginning word, uh, silence, 
to you silence is praise o god in zion that is the 65 one first verse and to you o sar fulfilled o hearer of prayer all flesh will come to you so we can understand silence in psalm 65 one not in a passive sense of resignation but in a sense of confident expectation the silence in the beginning of the psalm is it's not a passive sense of resignation but it is a a sense of confident expectation that's what we see in the word dumiya silence but it's not merely silence but it is a kind of waiting for salvation the silence can be understood as a uh, 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 as a medium for waiting the salvation of the lord the second section psalm 65 324 focuses on the temple in zion it emphasizes the gracious movement of god towards the people in terms of forgiving the sins that overwhelm them and in bringing god's chosen near to the temple zion is a holy place and a place where the presence the glory of god is present you know kabo the glory the glory of the lord is present in zion the word zion is very much coined in the post exilic period to emphasize the city of jerusalem as a holy city a chosen city and it is the city that god uh, god's presence is eternal or uh, uh, everywhere any time the third section of psalm uh, 65 5 to 8 focuses on god as savior and confidence of all the ends of the earth psalm 65 5 and 65 8 provide an indicio for the section with the verbal and thematic connections actually uh, while there are parallels between these verses you know uh, we see that there is no movement a specific movement we can actually identify it looks like there is no connection between but we can still psalm 655 focuses on god as the salvation and confidence of all uh, all the people while 658 speaks of the response of the inhabitants of the earth that's how these two verses connect the th- this third section to the other sections of the psalm the statement that the psalm 65 5 says you answer recalls the description of god as hearer of prayers psalm 65 2 and the stilling of the seas and and the turmoil of the peoples recalls that silence so silence as we said silence is something to wait to receive the salvation of the lord psalm 65 5 actually you know what is referred to uh, these terms of some deeds and salvation and signs and these are the terms that depict how god brings salvation to the people to the earth community within psalm 65 the terms most probably refer to other than historical events now we can't always find the historical connection uh, with the psalm to the people of uh, ancient israel 
but it is something that you know that informs the profound faith that the ancient faith community holds on in singing and praising the lord during their worship services by virtue of the structure of this section of the psalm third section they are closely associated with the matters described and stilling the seas god sets the foundations of the cosmos and brings order to it i mean god's uh, uh, keeping some foundations for the cosmos and also bringing order to the uh, creation which are the uh, termed as or the uh, awesome deeds and signs of god thus while each of the sections you know of psalm 65 has a distinct emphasis as we said they are intricately connected in the present form of the psalm the whole psalm stands as a unity the statement of god's founding and ordering action in the cosmos as its core center both structurally and conceptually the god in zion is the confluence of all the ends of the earth earth itself in terms of abundant fertility in psalm 65 9 to 13 joins in this universal praise of the god in zion the one who answers prayers thus psalm 65 both challenges and encourages all of us to see our relationship with earth and its relationship with god in ways different to those we have inherited the psalmist assumes an intricate connection between the activity in the sanctuary the orderliness of the cosmos and the nations and the fertility of earth that is the beauty of uh, psalm 65 that talks about the profound deep relationship between god and earth god's gracious action towards each part of the creation gives rise to the joyous response of each part worshipers peoples earth all this was part of the psalmist world view which saw connections many in our own world no longer see actually no longer trust the psalmist attributes a voice to earth that is the beauty of this psalm you know in psalm 8 we see that there is no voice for earth it is a self boasting of certain faith communities glorifying themselves in the presence of god probably uh, during the worship service psalm 29 96 to 97 what we see one psalm presents god in a terrific uh, uh, in a in a storm god a theophany that act actually according to ancient west asian stories that actually uh, exhibits the power and authority whereas 96 to 97 it invites earth and earth community to celebrate god's righteousness and justice the thunderstorm king becomes a life restoring power for the people and the earth joins in celebrating such a god in this psalm uh, psalm 65 god and earth we see that the psalmist attributes a voice to earth the psalmist sees earth as a living entity capable of giving praise to god this praise arises in the same way that human praise does in response to god's gracious life giving acts the psalmist asserts a fundamental continuity between god's regard for the chosen the peoples at the ends of the earth and the earth itself 
there is likewise continuity and connection between the responses of each in praise earth wise harmonizes the harmonizes with the joyous song of east and west and joins the silent praise of the peoples earth wise is a voice in prayer offer to the one who according to the psalmist hears prayer and answers that is the uh, relationship between god and earth and human beings join the voice of earth to pray to the lord and also to receive the answers from god to conclude psalm 65 god is the source of earth life and abundance i mean that is the main focus of psalm 65 particularly 65 9 to 11 emphasizes this with god as the subject of each of the verbs describing the process of bringing fertility to earth earth is the recipient of each action in these verses god provides grain tends and waters earth and blesses the growth the harvest which is rich and abundant and drips fatness comes as the result of god's goodness psalm 65:11 this is the relationship the deep and profound relationship between god and earth that the psalmist sings in psalm 65 so the earth's voice is a voice in prayer offer to the one who according to the psalmist hears and answers the prayers that is the beauty of this psalm Psalm 65 calls us to reassess our doctrines of creation. If we do so, it suggests that this process begin in worship. In our worship, we have to acknowledge that the earth, though it is not audible, the voice of earth is not audible. We need to acknowledge that. the voice of earth is also praying along with us <coughs> for our safety for our welfare for the well being of the earth community that that is the uh, relationship or profound relationship between god and earth that we see in psalm 65 the last sub topic for today's class is earth song in psalms 92 in 92 92 92 in this uh, song what we actually learn is that we move from theocentric and anthropocentric to earth centric reading of the scripture so we don't read psalms 90 91 92 from theocentric or anthropocentric but from earth centric reading theocentric read reading focuses on god and god centeredness anthropocentric focuses more on human human life human situation human wants and desires human safety human welfare terra centric more concerned about the earth earth becomes central focal of the interpretation the main central point for the interpretation so now we uh, move from theocentric and anthropocentric to earth centric reading of the psalms psalm psalms 90 91 and 92 psalm 90 actually traditionally you know 
it is a prayer of moses a man of god psalm 92 92 introduces the fourth book you know the book of psalms has been divided into five books book 1 book 2 like you know text 1 text 2 like that this one introduces the fourth book fourth book begins with psalm 90 ends with psalm 106 106 in the traditional five division of the psalter psalm 90 uh, begins with the fourth book and it appears to stand as a crucial juncture in the overall scre- scheme of the collection you know these psalms particularly psalm 92 psalm 106 are very important songs in the formation of the book of psalms and all the old testament scholars you know they talk about uh, uh, very deep issues about the faith of ancient israel particularly in relation to uh, the history of ancient israel during the period of kings however the fourth book does not open a word about david or his dynasty rather the superscription of psalm 90 shifts attention to moses a prayer for moses a man of god moses as we see moses was a great leader and he led the people from the land of oppression to the land of freedom egypt is a land of oppression where people experienced bonded labor oppression humiliation but he led them towards a land of promise the tradition the moses tradition remembered as the great intercessor for israel you know exodus uh, chapter 33 12 to 16 chapter 34 verse 9 and uh, even uh, uh, psalm 89 also is a plea of moses but in psalm 90 moses plea is not for himself but it is for the uh, entire community entire people of god not just for the davidic dynasty davidic monarchy so thus the fourth book actually psalm 90 91 92 up to psalm 106 106 they you know this uh, uh, fourth book is set for the fourth book seven references to moses that we see in this uh, uh, fourth book psalm 90 to na- psalm 106 psalm 90 99 103 105 and 106 we see the mentioning of moses in these psalms the concentration of uh, references to moses and his leadership during the wilderness era seems to invite uh, readers to meditate on the days of israel before david had ever come on the scene and israel had not yet entered canaan during those days yahweh was the king of ancient israel there was no davidic dynasty in the central theme in the psalms of the fourth book is heralded by the proclamation of yahweh malak i mean the lord reigns a theme which is identified as the organizing confession of the psalter of the fourth book scholars have different opinions you know they maintain different opinions to talk about why the fourth book emphasizes on uh, the history of ancient israel during the period of moses or before the monarchy probably to emphasize the uh, uh, monarchy or the sovereign rule of the lord over the universe <coughs> Psalm ninety two, ninety two, ninety, ninety one, ninety two 
may be intended as an answer to the trauma of exile and dispersion after the Babylonian overthrow of Jerusalem, the temple, and the Davidic monarchy in the early 16th century BC. Because they remind the people the past glory where they enjoyed the rule of the Lord and even uh, the, the servants of the Lord who led them from the land of oppression towards the land of a promise. As we said in the beginning, we move from theocentric, anthropocentric to terracentric, the earth-centered understanding of these Psalms. That's what we find, earth songs in Psalms 90, 91, and 92. Earth acknowledges God, the eternal mainstay. Psalm 91 to 6. Earth addresses God, speaking for the universe of which it is a part for itself and all its inhabitants, acknowledging its place within divine milieu. Earth recognizes God as the mainstay who, like a birthing mother, brings forth and sustains all from aeon to aeon, from age to age. That's what, you know, Psalm 90 says, O God, you are the God of ages. You have been our God for ages, the eternal God. So now we are looking at the Psalm from earth point of view, not from anthropocentric, not from human point of view. Humans acknowledge their ephemeral nature. Earth's voice, although still addressed to God, alerts humans to their reality as ephemeral creatures. Ephemeral means ephemeral, you know, they simply vanish in a blink of an eye. Raising from the dust of earth like grass and soon returning to earth. Now, we need to actually understand how earth is understood in the song of the psalmist or in the song of the faith community in the ancient days. Earth prays for divine favor and renewal, 13 to 17. Earth speaks for itself and all its inhabitants, human and non-human, all of who are God's servants in one way or another. Earth asks for a new kind of shared present, one in which the work of God, the work of earth, and the work of everyone in the earth. Psalm 90 actually, you know, it is interpreted as a prayer of earth. And earth is the child body of God. It laments over the passing of species. The life is very fragile. The humans are ephemeral. You know, they simply vanish in a blink of an eye. Earth is eternal as God is eternal. Because Earth can represent Earth can represent the voice of ephemeral creatures like human beings. That is the beauty of Psalm 90. That's why it's a prayer of earth. And earth is the child body of God. And it laments over the passing of species. And Psalm 91. Psalm 91 is also a psalm uh, for earth. That's what uh, we read here. And the interpreter of this psalm, particularly as we have in our syllabus, he proposes to the tune of do not destroy. 
Yeah, that is the tune that he proposes. To the tune of Do Not Destroy forges a strong link to one mitkam in particular, Psalm 57. You know, the, a, a, a mitkam, uh, you are seeing a, a title, a mitkam. Psalm 91 for earth, a mitkam. Mitkam is something, you know, of course, the meaning is still disputable. But the Septuagint translation suggests that we read this psalm as if it were some sort of inscription. Uh, you know, it, it, it's a kind of assurance of deliverance from enemies and the death for those who take refuge in the divine. I mean, miktam, the tune miktam is generally sung in the context where the faith community you know, approach God for God's help or God's assurance of deliverance from enemies and death for those who take refuge in God. So the interpreter of this psalm, he adds to the tune of do not destroy. An anonymous fossil-like inscription recites what is human life. A protective incantation for earth, God, the divine mainstay, forms the protective charm. I mean, this is the main chunk or main uh, uh, content of the Psalm 91. The anonymous speaker addresses the earth. Somebody, the voice could be that of a long, extinct, you know, a, 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 a species that is no more now. Uh, something uh, extinct amnoid cephalophod, one of the millions, you know, that flourished during the Mesozoic age, which Levin has dubbed the age of ammonites. You know, the psalmist imagines that someone or some species you know, uh, addressed uh, in this psalm in order to talk about uh, the earth and its eternity or its eternal place in the life of human beings. Whatever fossil uh, creature we hear speaking, its opening sentences reaffirm and extend the message proclaimed at the beginning of the earth song, God, the mainstay from age to age. So uh, that is something that we you know. See, Psalm 90 and 91, both are connected. Both are considered as one uh, a, a long song. In the light of the, these considerations and in view of our superscription to the tune of Do Not Destroy, we may interpret the fossil-like earth inscription, that is Psalm 91, as a sort of protective charm or incantation for earth. Life forms may come and go, Psalm 91.7. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but earth itself shall remain. Earth remains forever. Earth has its own eternity in the plan of God. Remember, we are not uh, looking at the psalm from anthropocentric point of view, but we are looking at the psalm from terra-centric point of view, from earth-centered uh, view that we have taken. The earth and its eternity. The earth remains forever. The human community or living species may vanish over the period of time. So, uh, 
the last portion god the divine mainstay forms the protective charm this portion of the earth song concludes with a response by the divine mainstay that echoes the charm like incantation in the previous verses as we see god promises protection and rescues in times rescue in times of trouble and uh, and a lengthy of days to earth and all and all who call upon the divine name this phrase is a uh, reminiscent of the conclusion of psalm 23 Psalm twenty-three. What we uh, read in last verse: "I live in your temple forever, in your presence forever." Which looks forward to a return to God's house for an, and of the conclusion of Psalm ninety-three, which affirms that holiness befits God's house for an overcoming. Actually, the 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 abode of the Lord. shelter of the most high and the refuge of the divine mainstay the psalm 91 affirms and upholds you know certain uh, 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 a specific characteristics of earth that is unique to the earth not to the human beings because earth is eternal on earth's time scale this length of days could mean additional millions or billions of years long after our current ecological crisis has become as a distant a memory as that of the fossil creatures we have imagined speaking to us in psalm 91 so millions and billions of years earth will remain earth shall remain and the last psalm psalm 92 a psalm a song of earth for the sabbath day a song of earth for the sabbath day i'll finish in 5 to uh, maybe 5 to 7 minutes then we can uh, take few minutes if there there are any questions then we'll wind up except for the interpolation a song of earth the superscription is that which appears in the hebrew bible in thinking of the sabbath day we may also keep in mind the sabbath year described in leviticus chapter 25 so sabbath actually means a complete rest you know sabbath the idea of sabbath installed in the uh, 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 the law of moses is to help the people earth to have a complete rest in a year after 7 years the eighth year shall be a complete rest thereby the the human community the earth community the earth will rejuvenate itself and regain strength and the power of fertility earth the child body of god praises god and celebrates its renewal during sabbath so sabbath is a period where the earth gets a renewal and regain strength and the power of fertility in order to sustain life in its abundance earth blesses its righteous children and acknowledges the eternal rock this is a wonderful uh, expression that you know uh, the voice of earth brings the blessings for the children on the earth finally we may hear in psalm 92 8 to 11 earth triumphant assertion that it is indeed to be feared and respected as the child body of god the bold juxtaposition of the climatic tricolor in psam 92:9 with 92:11 the 
bespeaks earth conviction that its enemies are also god's enemies you know earth represents the divine the divine power for the protection well being and sustaining of sustenance of human communities earth plays a vital role to continue the life the life in its abundance so when we look at the psalms 90 91 92 from terra centric point of view we can actually derive a new meaning of earth and the purpose of its existence the principle of purpose can be actually drawn into the interpretation of psalm 90 91 92 so that we can derive a meaning that helps us to understand the uniqueness of earth and its existence for the good of the humanity not only humanity for the good of living beings on this earth thank you for patiently listening to me this evening thank you and god bless you thank you priya and due to time constraint only one question is permitted from the uh, audience side yes reverend christopher david you may proceed with the question uh, you may proceed with the question thank you aya for this wonderful presentation uh, it was uh, very interesting to know about uh, earth perspective terra centric perspectives uh, just i would like to have one question um, uh, as you mentioned earth remains forever so i think i have a question does the life span of god have variation in each creation of god so i think when we think of life span of each creation i think there we see the equality in god's creation so even when when we think of a terra centric perspectives does the creation of god have the variation of life span in the creation of god thank you ayya yeah there is an another question dr a shiba princess uh, has written here i think these two questions are about the terra centric reading of the scriptures uh, don't you think the terra centric reading of the scriptures is an attempt to dethrone theocentric foundation of christianity uh i don't think so because terra centric reading of the scriptures is an attempt to understand you know the role of earth in the life of uh, human beings and human communities it is to understand the effective role that earth plays in the day to day sustenance of uh, living beings on the earth perhaps we don't deny theocentric uh, reading of the scriptures but we introduced and we allowed to have terra centric in order to uh, in order to see the other way around where the voice of earth is negated silenced and even you know uh, unheard i don't think that it uh, it is uh, it it dethrones the theocentric foundation of uh, the church or faith community because it is an attempt to understand and to uh, you know uh, deal with the issues in and around earth uh and christopher david you have asked yes there is uh, you know as you as you uh, observed there is an equality uh, in the creation of god and the life, when it comes to the life span of god god has set uh, you know a different time period for different cre- creatures you see all creatures do not have the same life span you know human being 
when we uh, when we look at the ancient uh, times book of genesis someone lived for hundreds of years but in our context in today's 21st century we have our own uh, uh, limited of life span same with the creatures but the earth remains forever does it mean that only god can decide and design the life span of the earth because in psalm 8 though psalm 8 uh, uh, makes no voice for earth it affirms that earth is the footstool of the lord it belongs to the lord god has a particular purpose for the earth probably to continue the life in all its uh, uh, in all its essence so when it comes to the life span of earth i think uh, you know it varies with the uh, living beings and even human beings it has its own uh, uh, years of uh, uh, length of a life span and we cannot actually imagine how does it go